Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Yannis Emanuelidis, and I want to welcome you to this online public event on Germany's priorities for the presidency of the Council in the second half of this year. I'm very happy to have with us today the permanent representative of Germany, Ambassador Michael Klaus. Um, so welcome and a good morning to you. And in less than four weeks, um, Germany will assume uh, the Council presidency. And as a founding member, it is already the 13th time that the country will assume that role. Uh, it also marks, by the way, the beginning of uh, a new trio presidency with Portugal and Slovenia following the German presidency in 2021. Um, and obviously this comes at a very uh, special time. It is a special presidency. Uh, it comes when the EU and the member states uh, find themselves in a particular situation uh, where we are all hit by the COVID-19 crisis with which is still an unprecedented crisis and it's unpredictable, unpredictable in terms of its outcome with a lot of potential consequences with respect to public health, which is obvious, the economic consequences, um, but also potential societal consequences within and between European societies, potential political, geopolitical, geoeconomic consequences. So a multi-dimensional, multifaceted crisis which we're all facing. And already some are speaking that the German presidency will be a Corona presidency. Um, and the particular significance and the, of the upcoming presidency and the strong interest in it uh, manifests itself also by the circumstance that today we have more than 850 people who have registered for this event. Um, we always have high numbers when we do these uh, breakfast briefings on the German presidency, but this number is particularly high. <laughs> And it does not only show the strong interest in the presidency, but also the high expectations in the German Council presidency. Um, and that comes as no surprise. There are many key issues which are on the agenda. Let me just mention a few. Um, the negotiations on the next multi-annual financial framework and the recovery instrument, next generation EU, as the commission has uh, named it. Um, the question how we can achieve a green recovery, a digital recovery, so having in mind um, of what were already the strategic priorities defined by the European Council in 2019, and which were also key strategic priorities of the Ursula von der Leyen Commission, uh, issues related to the future of migration and asylum policy, where the Commission will come forward with the so-called new pact, uh, rule of law, which is always a key issue, but it's in particular important now, given that in many member states, we've seen that uh, the COVID-19 crisis has also led to the undermining of certain uh, fundamental principles and rights, and we will have a first annual um, rule of law report by the Commission this year. Um, then the buzzword of strategic autonomy, uh, which is uh, now has a new and probably expanded meaning in light of the crisis, uh, plus many more issues on the agenda, uh, including, for example, the future relationship between the EU and the UK um, and the Conference on the Future of Europe. So a lot of things to discuss, and I'm very happy that we have with us uh, Ambassador Klaus, who will provide an overview of the uh, presidency priorities. There is no need um, to introduce him. He's very well known in this town, Brussels, but also beyond. He's a highly experienced connoisseur of European politics and policies. He had been the head of the German federal government secretariat for the European Convention. That was in 2002 to 2005. This is also the first time we met at the time, if I remember correctly. Uh, he had then been Deputy Director General and then Director General for European Affairs at the Foreign Office in Berlin between 2005 and 2013. Um, then he left Europe and became an ambassador in China uh, between 2013 and 2015. So he also has a good view of Europe from the outside, from one of our key strategic partners. And since August of 2018, he is permanent representative of Germany um, to the European Union. In terms of orchestration, we've agreed that uh, Ambassador Klaus will present the priorities that will take him roughly around 10 minutes. Um, then I and him will be engaged in the short discussions among the two of us. And in the second half of today's event, obviously we will open the floor for questions and comments from all of you. Um, and here's some technical um, uh, indications for that. There are two ways how you can uh, intervene. One way is that you, in a written form, write your question. You just need to click on the enter a question button uh, on the right part of your screen, write the question, hit enter, 
Um, please be brief. Um, I would say tweet length for your questions because I assume that there will be many questions. I will be monitoring them. So the shorter you are, the easier it will be. And I will try my best to get as many questions to the ambassador as possible. And then there's a second way uh, you can also address questions, which is that you uh, click on the hand shaped button again on your right. If you click on that hand shaped button, uh, I will see that you want to take the floor and I will be able to give you the floor in order for you to orally pose a question to the ambassador. Uh, but please be reminded that if I give you the floor, you also will have to unmute yourself technically on your side so that you will be that we will all be able to hear you. So enough of words of introduction from my side. Um, we can now get started. So again, thank you, Ambassador Klaus, for being with us today. The floor is yours. Um, please. Well, thanks very much for the introduction and uh, good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to participate in this uh, virtual meeting on the German presidency. And uh, by the way, it's my third presidency. The first one I assisted here as a junior officer in uh, 99, that was the last millennium. <laughs> and in 2007, I did it from the Berlin side. So let's see what it's going to be uh, like this time. Um, as you have already uh, said, it's not the presidency that we have been preparing for for years. Uh, you dubbed it uh, the Corona presidency, and I think that's uh, the right way to look at it. So what is going to be different? Since the Corona crisis hit us here um, in uh, Brussels, uh, we didn't have any physical meetings anymore at a political level since uh, March, and activity the council that means uh, the number of meetings that you usually have in a presidency has gone down to something like 10 uh, percent the trilogues uh, with the european parliament uh, basically uh, come to a grinding halt which means all the legislative uh, work uh, has uh, has been discontinued now is this uh, going to be very different from uh, 1st of july when the german presidency starts i think there's not going to be a fundamental change we hope that from the uh, beginning of September on, uh, we will in general be able again to have uh, physical meetings of people coming from the capitals. That means at the political level. But as far as council work is concerned, uh, the rule of social distancing will be with us, at least until the end of the German presidency and probably beyond which means that the capacity of the German presidency when it comes to meetings will be maximum 30% of what usually we would be able to do. Now, obviously, we try to compensate uh, by using video conferences like we do now. But uh, experience shows they are only 20% as effective as the physical meetings. Uh, usually, when you try to strike a deal, you have the 27 uh, sitting in the room and uh, well, they will state official positions uh, via microphone, but then they will meet uh, somewhere in the corners, interact and uh, try the, in the margins of the meeting to strike a deal. That is no longer possible if it's a virtual meeting. And uh, second, uh, there's also no confidentiality of meeting. Uh, usually when you uh, have a certain number or depass a certain number of uh, participants, you don't actually know who is uh, participating and uh, who is not. So there is no confidentiality. And also we have seen there is no uh, interpretation. That means usually politicians uh, read out uh, the prepared notes and there's not, it's not as interactive as you would normally have in a council. So that means uh, with a video conference, uh, we cannot uh, make up for the lack of the capacities. So that is one thing, uh, the constraints under which we will be operating in the six months of the German presidency. And then at the same time, you already lined out, uh, there is new priorities. It's about overcoming the pandemic crisis. This is the top priority, which means crisis management, which means uh, exit strategies that will well continue into the German presidency and uh, recovery. This is going to be the top priority. And that is the absolute must do for us. And then uh, there's some other things uh, that we cannot um, push into the next presidency that must be done in the German presidency. 
Brexit uh, was mentioned. Uh, we are under um, we work under the assumption that the United Kingdom is not going to ask for an extension. That means a deal needs to be struck uh, in the in the next uh, six months. We cannot push it into the next presidency. So this is a must do. Then obviously the budget uh, for the next years and even things like uh, fish quotas uh, cannot wait. Uh, must be done this year. And there are several dossiers like this. And then comes the second category of those uh, issues and dossiers where we would love to make progress and where we will try to make as much progress as possible, like migration, like uh, Green Deal. Um, maybe uh, let's look at uh, the German presidency and um, what the phases are. Phase one, uh, going to start 1st of July, obviously, will be dominated uh, by trying to get a deal on MFF and uh, the recovery fund. We hope to have an agreement uh, before summer break in uh, July. This is going to be difficult, it's going to be extremely difficult, but it's possible. The main issues uh, that uh, are under discussion are, like always when you discuss uh, money, is uh, the volume, I mean, how much uh, money is available. And uh, here comes also the issue of uh, money that is in the recovery fund. Um, Will it uh, be grants? Uh, that means uh, it will go to uh, those member states uh, most in need and there is no need to repay. Or is it going to be loans, uh, which means it needs to be repaid? Uh, that is uh, one set of uh, discussions about the volume. The second is always of uh, uh, who gets how much. <laughs> As you might imagine, um, uh, that is also something uh, which is extremely controversial allocation. And the third is uh, on conditionality. Does the money come uh, with strings attached? Like that uh, reforms need to be implemented or not? And here you have different opinions. You have some countries saying uh, there should be any strings attached and they would know best of uh, where to spend the money. And you would have others saying, no, uh, this needs to go to certain sectors and uh, there needs to be a kind of a, a, a tight uh, oversight and, uh, and a robust uh, uh, governance. Uh, as far as the timetable is concerned, uh, the president of the European Council yesterday has announced that heads of state and government will have a video conference on this issue on 19th of uh, June. This is not negotiations yet, but it's the first exchange of views. And then uh, we expect, uh, but it has not been scheduled yet, a physical meeting of heads of state and government uh, in July, probably in beginning of July. But that is up to President uh, Charles Michel uh, to decide. Well, that is uh, phase one, MFF recovery, and then comes phase two. And this is going to be dominated uh, by Brexit. Uh, I, I can keep it short. It's about the future relations between the European Union and uh, the United Kingdom. So far, as uh, all of you are aware, uh, uh, no real progress has been made in the negotiations. It's more like both uh, sides um, highlighting uh, and stating uh, their positions. In June, that means this month, probably there's going to be a high level meeting with the President of the Commission, President of the European Council and uh, the British Prime Minister to take stock a little bit. Um, as you know, uh, those uh, issues under discussion are the future access of the United Kingdom and its companies uh, to uh, the internal market. Uh, which is connected to the issue of a level playing field. Do they have to apply a kind of um, the same rules on the state aid, for example, environment standards, and uh, so on and so on, or not? Uh, another issue um, that is uh, uh, very important for quite some member states uh, is the issue of fish quotas, because internally in these countries uh, it, it has a high visibility. That means, uh, uh, will, the, will um, EU member states uh, keep their fish quota to fish in the UK waters also after uh, Brexit has been done? And then another issue is about the governance. So what if there's a disagreement on uh, how to read uh, the treaty and uh, what can be done? So these are, there's a lot of other issues as well, but these are the most uh, difficult issues. We hope that uh, we will have a deal by the European uh, Council in the, by, that the, the European uh, Council in October uh, can confirm. That means uh, we envisage uh, to be there around the second half of um, October. 
we cannot be much later because uh, any treaty would need to be ratified, at least by European Parliament, uh, which uh, will need some time. So, is a deal possible? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. But I think it also means that the UK needs to have a more realistic approach. Um, to, to put it short, I think you cannot have a full sovereignty and at the same time full access uh, to the internal market. So, this Brexit issue is going to absorb a lot of political or most of the political attention we expect in uh, September and October. And then uh, phase uh, three, we might also start before, but, but then uh, there will be room for doing those issues uh, that are very important to us, like uh, migration. We will probably start before, depending on when the Commission is going to present its proposal. For five years, uh, uh, we have been negotiating uh, in the Council uh, without result, uh, because this issue is highly ideological, and that's, that means it's uh, also highly toxic. Now, the Commission will come up with a proposal, and uh, of course, uh, speed is important, but more important is uh, to get it right. Uh, it needs to be a proposal uh, that will be accepted as a basis uh, for negotiations, which are going to be extremely difficult. If that is not the case, uh, then we will not get uh, anywhere. Um, I don't expect uh, the German presidency to be able uh, to close uh, the matter. It's just too complex and uh, too, too difficult uh, to, to resolve, and member states are still quite far uh, apart. But uh, I, I think it would be realistic to expect that we have an agreement on a way forward on a political roadmap, uh, which uh, could be also quite uh, substantial. Then obviously, I mean, Green Deal uh, will be important. It will heavily influence the uh, recovery instrument and a uh, lot of money that is being spent now uh, on MFF and recovery will be in line with the Green Deal and uh, be used to reach uh, the objectives. Then just a last word on the Future of Europe conference. This is important. It's important to us, but still it's not very clear when it is going to start. As I said, fighting and overcoming the pandemic is our top priority. And it is a bit difficult to see the conference really beginning before the pandemic is uh, overcome because uh, all the focus, the, the attention will be focused on the pandemic and also um, it's a little bit, um, well, uh, difficult to see that you would start this without the possibility of uh, physical meetings. And then obviously, I mean, there are other things uh, that are important uh, to us which might not have uh, the same visibility as the issues I just mentioned, uh, like rule of law and uh, many others, but uh, I don't want to elaborate on this, but uh, that just as an overview on what uh, we at this stage uh, believe uh, the Corona presidency will look like. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for this uh, overview of priorities, but also very importantly for providing us uh, with insights about the different phases, uh, which uh, we will be experiencing over the upcoming months. Uh, we all see that there are a lot of things which are on the agenda. Let me start with a um, rather general question. It sounds very general, but I think it's important in order to put things a bit into perspective. Um, you used also the term uh, Corona presidency, um, which many are now using, and I think it's the right not, thing. Not officially. <laughs> yeah. I, I used it, so you only uh, quoted something I had said. Um, so. Um, but I wonder, uh, what's your opinion in terms of how significant is this crisis, not only with respect to the presidency, but in general? There are some people who argue um, this is a watershed moment. It is maybe a make or break moment for the European Union. There are some who have even said that uh, it is an existential crisis uh, for Europe. Um, on the other side, we hear some voices which are Euro rather euphoric um, in the context of the uh, uh, proposals from the Commission on the recovery instrument, the next generation EU proposal, um, there were some who were saying this might be a Hamiltonian moment. So they foresee that we might make a big step forward and use this crisis uh, in order to progress with respect to European integration in a massive way. If I would ask you, how would you define this particular moment in which Germany is assuming the presidency from a broader perspective? 
Well, when um, the first, uh, when the when the last uh, big economic and financial crisis uh, broke out, uh, 2008 and the following years, and uh, we still haven't completely overcome all the damage uh, that had been uh, done. And I compare to now, I think this is a much bigger crisis we face here. And I would say, yes, uh, it, it is existential. If you look uh, into some um, of our member states who have been extremely hard hit, um, this is existential. And that is also the reason why uh, Germany did something which uh, nobody had expected, that we had a Franco-German initiative uh, saying uh, we would be ready to offer 500 uh, billion euro in grants which need to not to be repaid and that is uh, something that i think nobody would have expected a couple of weeks ago but i think it's due to that everybody uh, including in berlin did understand uh, the dimension of this uh, crisis we are facing um, so uh, that is something um, uh, that uh, will have a uh, repercussions. I don't know how much it is going to change the European Union. I think at some stage, uh, probably later this year, the conference uh, on the future of Europe uh, will start and I expect this uh, to be an issue, consequences uh, that might uh, flow from this. Is it a Hamiltonian moment or not? It depends on what you understand by it. Uh, if it's the first step uh, towards uh, the United States of, uh, of Europe, I'd be maybe a bit more cautious. I think that would be a bit premature to see <laughs> in uh, 20, 30 years time, maybe we'll look at, back at it and see it was or it wasn't. Yes, I agree with you on that. Uh, I think Hamiltonian moment is describing probably something which goes a bit too far. But having said that, and, and having, I'm <clears throat> sorry for this, for you sharing your, um, your general impressions, um, with respect to the overall role of the German presidency, in the past, we've always heard when the country assumes a presidency that the country will try to be an honest broker between member states. And obviously, this is a key role which uh, any presidency has to play. Um, it's also, um, and we had an event yesterday with uh, uh, State Minister Michel Roth, uh, who was using the term uh, bridge builder. We need to build bridges between member states to find compromises. At the same time, um, there is also high expectations with respect to the leadership role of the German presidency. So I think if you compare it to presidencies previously, uh, one, because of Germany's size and significance um, as a member state, but also the particular moment with the COVID-19 crisis, there are a lot to say that this presidency will have to show particular leadership in moving things in a certain direction, maybe even having a vision of where things should be moving in future. How would you define in more general terms uh, what role the presidency should be playing under the present circumstances? Well, I think the big challenge uh, we are facing now is actually the survival of the Eurozone and uh, the European Union. And uh, we have been, I think, rising to the challenge with this Franco-German initiative, which paved the way for the Commission proposal, uh, which I believe uh, will there will be changes here and there, but basically uh, that is what I would expect uh, to, to be agreed uh, even before the summer and uh, to do the trick. And I think also here we have been shown that we are already in a presidential mode. And yes, I mean, it is uh, showing leadership at the same time as uh, this will only be accepted if uh, we're seen as an honest broker and uh, not uh, promoting uh, only national positions. I mean, honest broker means that uh, you put your national uh, positions a little bit aside. I mean, you don't forget them uh, completely, but, but this is, uh, is quite different. I mean, the, the uh, overall objective is uh, to reach agreement uh, in the Council and with the European Parliament and uh, to, to, to rise uh, to the challenge and uh, to, to get this done. So uh, leadership, yes, uh, definitely, and honest broker at the same time, because otherwise it will not be accepted. Yes, and you already mentioned uh, the Franco-German proposal, which I think, as you correctly described, was a strong basis in order to allow also the Commission to come forward with its proposals. So it's also the co-leadership between uh, Berlin and Paris in making sure that things will be moving. Um, one question related, and we have already a, a lot of written questions which have come in, so I've been scanning them in parallel. 
So there are a good number of questions related to uh, obviously the MFF and the recovery instrument. Um, and so let me come to this before I open the floor by taking even more questions and maybe also allowing people to raise their voice uh, orally. Um, you've mentioned that uh, this is that the Commission's proposal is a basis. Obviously, things will have to be discussed. You mentioned key issues which will be on the agenda, uh, the overall size, the conditions attached, um, links to the rule of law uh, question, um, also maybe the balance between loans and grants uh, in the overall compromise. Um, but you were saying that there's a good chance that we will get an agreement um, before the summer break. Um, I think that, that, that there are strong political arguments in favor of that because I personally believe that the economic situation in many member states will deteriorate over the upcoming months. So maybe in the fall, it might be even more difficult to find a compromise. But what makes you confident um, that actually a compromise can be found um, on the MFF and the recovery instrument. Um, and there was also a question which was posed um, by two or three who wanted uh, you to say a bit more about the MFF component of the compromise. Um, so what kind of MFF can we expect? Um, so these two things, why before the summer, why do you think that there's enough pressure to get there? And a bit of uh, more words on the MFF, <clears throat> sorry, the MFF uh, part of that compromise. Well, eight days ago, the Commission proposal was uh, presented to Corepair, and uh, as uh, uh, usual, there, there was a you know a tour de table uh, where every uh, delegation uh, gave its preliminary view, and it was interesting to hear and uh, and very comforting that no one said uh, this is not a basis for negotiations. Uh, that that means uh, it is accepted as a basis for negotiations, which is the first uh, uh, important uh, step. And then second, everybody underlined that that is a matter of urgency. There was no one who was saying, you know, take your time and uh, we have all the time we need and uh, we don't get it done this year, we do it next year. So you can see that the, I think the uh, dimension of the crisis uh, and the dimension of the challenge has been understood by everybody. And that's what makes me optimistic that uh, we will uh, be able to find a deal. Uh, though uh, you might have seen um, uh, this proposal consists of a thousand pages, it's uh, <laughs> mostly very technical and uh, it will take uh, still weeks uh, for all of us uh, to completely understand uh, what it means and uh, that's um, why negotiations uh, also will not really start uh, be before July because uh, this is uh, quite uh, heavy stuff. Now, on the uh, MFF uh, component, as far as we have seen, uh, MFF is uh, mostly unchanged. I think basically the Commission uh, did not uh, do a lot of changes, uh, but left it where it was uh, when we broke negotiations uh, end of uh, February. But at the same time, I think it was important uh, to have a MFF and um, uh, recovery uh, fund together so it's interlinked you cannot uh, separate it i think this is for technical reasons uh, this is important but also for political reasons uh, difficult uh, to to see that you make uh, ministers of finance uh, pay twice you know first you have a recovery fund and then you come with the mff it's usually not uh, the way it works and then also this is a big package uh, and uh, in the end uh, everybody uh, must prove at home that he's a winner so uh, someone who doesn't uh, you know gets less on recovery uh, might get more on mff so you can compensate you can negotiate it you can make deals i think that's also another important aspect of it and uh, we'll see a lot of bargaining uh, going on in the coming weeks there's a um, now i'm going also to the questions which i see here in front of me the written questions and I see that also some have already raised their hands, so I'll come to you also in a second. Um, there's a question here which says, uh, what efforts will the German presidency going to take towards the frugal poor uh, in view of reaching a compromise on the MFF? So what can the German presidency do or help in order to uh, also make uh, a compromise possible, including obviously then also the frugal poor? That's the question which is posed by uh, Anastasios Papadopoulos. Well, first of all, um, uh, this is uh, the president of the European Council, uh, which is in charge of uh, the dossier and uh, will have to call everybody and will also present a negotiating uh, box at uh, some stage. 
that hopefully then will be uh, the basis uh, for uh, negotiations. And um, at the same time, I mean, it's very clear that uh, we will try to assist and to help because uh, we want a deal. And I think it's also no surprise that uh, the Chancellor I mean, is in close uh, context uh, with most heads of state and government, uh, including those of the so-called uh, frugal four. Um, we have a good number of questions uh, related to the relationship between EU and China. Uh, and as I said in, the, in my introduction, you had already also been ambassador of Germany to China for some years, so you know the country and also the relationship between Europe and China very well. Uh, so people are asking, one about um, the EU-China summit, where there was news yesterday, um, and the Leipzig uh, summit, which had been planned. Uh, and there's a more concrete question by Fraser Cameron, who asks um, what the key elements of a quote unquote, new robust strategy of the EU towards uh, China should look like. So China, both with respect to the, uh, um, to the uh, summit, or the summit which had been scheduled, um, but also with respect to uh, the strategy of Europe and towards China uh, in this period and in the future, obviously. Well, unfortunately, we had to postpone uh, the Leipzig uh, summit because of uh, the ongoing uh, pandemic, uh, the challenge, the travel restrictions uh, we have in Europe, but uh, that also exist in China. And so uh, the president of the European Council, uh, the president of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping, and the chancellor uh, decided that it would be uh, better to postpone and the new date uh, will be fixed. That is unfortunate, uh, but uh, you also saw that uh, G7 had to be or will be rescheduled and had to be um, uh, postponed. Um, we still believe it is important. It would be the first uh, meeting um, uh, in this configuration. Uh, the President of the People's Republic of China and the 27 heads of state and uh, 27 heads of state and government of the EU. It would be uh, first uh, ever, and uh, so we hope that uh, that can be uh, done relatively soon, but no date yet. On a, a new robust strategy, I don't think we need. Uh, the Commission uh, did, uh, and the External Action Service did uh, present uh, an excellent uh, paper on China last spring, and uh, I think it is still valid and it does not need to be revised. It is this paper where we say that. Uh, China uh, is a very important and strategic partner, and at the same time, a strategic competitor. Um, there's someone who's asking um, whether there is already a, um, a new date uh, foreseen with respect to the EU-China summit, um, and what actually the, the significance is of the fact that um, the summit uh, was postponed. Um, and you mentioned that the key reasons relate uh, to the COVID-19, uh, also the practical, the health-related challenges. Um, but there's a question here from someone in the audience who's asking as to whether there is also a, that this is also potentially a political message. Uh, and the question is making a link, um, not only uh, between the EU and uh, China, but also with respect to the US-Chinese relationship and as to whether this uh, did also affect the fact that, the, that there is a postponement. I think I can be very short on this. So no new date has been fixed. It will take some more time. And uh, uh, the postponement was exclusively COVID related. Good. Um, I will try now to go to um, the audience, to some who have uh, raised their hands. So I have André de Munter, um, who has raised his hands. Uh, you have been unmuted. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, perfectly. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Please, uh, your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I, I'm André de Munter, uh, working on uh, enlargement in the European Parliament. And I have a question on the Berlin process, uh, which was uh, for uh, candidates and potential uh, candidates in the Western Balkans, which was launched at the initiative of Chancellor Merkel in uh, August 2014. Uh, my question to you would be, how do you see the future uh, as Germany has always been a key player uh, and promoter of enlargement? How do you see the future of this Berlin process, in particular in light of the um, new methodology launched by the Commission in early February, which also foresees uh, more um, regular EU Western Balkans summits? Thank you very much. 
Well, first of all, uh, we continue to be one of those who are very much in uh, favor of enlargement and, uh, you know, they were about to uh, start uh, and to agree on a negotiating framework with Macedonia and uh, or what's called the Republic of North Macedonia and Albania. This will be one of the other uh, important topics in the uh, German presidency. So I would expect that uh, to be sometime in, uh, in, in autumn. As far as new methodology is uh, concerned, uh, I think we're fully behind because uh, I think it does help uh, to streamline the negotiations and to have more uh, interactions and also involvement of uh, member states. And when it comes to Western Balkans, um, this uh, continues to be a strategic priority uh, for us. It's it's about enlargement, but it's also enlargement is also uh, for us important uh, because of the uh, geopolitical situation. Uh, we, we see that there's uh, quite a few other foreign actors who try to gain influence, uh, like uh, China, uh, Russia, uh, Turkey. And uh, that is something that uh, we also have to, to keep uh, in view. And that's also why we advocate of uh, moving on enlargement and uh, taking the Western Balkan into the European Union. Thank you. Let's take now a next question, Remo Hess. Um, I see that you've raised your voice. Uh, uh, Remo Hess, my colleagues have unmuted you. Can you hear us? Can We hope that we can hear you. Yes, I can Very hear good. you. We can hear you, please. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Um, I'm aware that my question might be uh, some sort of a niche question, so I will be uh, very brief. Another thing that uh, will fall into the German presidency is the Swiss file and um, quest, the year long quest for a new institutional agreement and basis for, um, between Switzerland and the European Union. So, um, how will you treat this um, file? Um, is it something that will also can be uh, pushed back or is it something that has priority and how will you how would you like to get it out of the dead end where it's stuck um, until now and maybe secondly a more uh, european um, question with the european dimension how do you assess um, the commission's proposal for own resources um, 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 that accompany the recovery and maybe in special um, the, the plan for uh, some sort of a um, uh, access tax for um, big companies to the European single market. Thank you. Thank you. So two here, EU, Switzerland and own resources. Well, let me start with the easy stuff, the new own resources. <laughs> <laughs> Already yesterday in, in Coripair, you could hear this is not going to be easy. So uh, it is very clear that is something uh, that will not be agreed upon uh, in this uh, framework MFF recovery fund. But that is something that we will touch upon uh, at a later stage. Uh, so this is probably not going to be a big issue uh, during the German presidency. Your own resources, uh, we have been uh, discussing uh, for years, if not uh, decades, and uh, there are several problems uh, connected to this. Uh, one is that uh, many of these, uh, like digital tax or uh, FTT or whatever, is already uh, something uh, ministers, national ministers of finance have that set their eyes on, and it's uh, part of kind of uh, the national finance program for the coming years. Uh, so that is uh, one set of problem. And then, um, uh, well, uh, it's it's difficult. Uh, new own resources, you need agreement. Uh, that means uh, consensus, unanimity. And uh, whatever you propose, uh, there's always uh, someone who will have to pay more and uh, others who will uh, be paying less depending on what it is. So, for example, if it's on uh, CTS and these things, uh, Member states uh, that heavily uh, bet on uh, coal energy uh, will have to pay a lot, and others, I mean, have uh, uh, other forms of alternative energy uh, will pay uh, basically nothing. Um, depends on what uh, tax uh, you look at. It was just an uh, example, but, but that means it's very difficult to find something that is uh, being seen as just and fair by everybody. That is probably the reason why we have been discussing this uh, for many years. Now, um, there's an incentive uh, to move on, uh, not just because the uh, European Parliament also uh, attaches high importance to it, but also that uh, uh, 
uh, the debts uh, we are running uh, need to be repaid um, uh, between, as a commissioner suggested, uh, sometime late uh, in, in, from 28 to 58 or whatever we will be agreeing on. And then uh, there is uh, the possibility you take it from the national budget or you try to have new own resources. That means, uh, well, to sum it up, uh, we will start a new debate, but uh, it won't be easy to, to come to results. Then on the Swiss uh, file, uh, I think we are uh, waiting now for this uh, referendum that has been postponed in the Switzerland. And uh, as I understand also uh, that uh, things uh, will probably also on the Swiss side uh, be uh, easier to, to find, find a deal after. So I don't expect uh, too much movement uh, in the next couple of weeks and months. The, going back to the first answer you provided, I was going through all the questions we received. Thanks for that. A lot of questions, by the way. Um, there's one question related to the own resources, which goes uh, a bit a step further, saying um, which of the potential uh, alternatives which the Commission has proposed um, has the highest likelihood um, in order to find a compromise among the 27? Um, the Commission presented a whole list of potential alternatives. Of, uh, new own resources and uh, so the question here being posed is which of these have the highest chance uh, of uh, getting through or at least finding uh, some kind of a compromise in the, in the in the council the european council when we were still negotiating uh, the uh, former mff uh, proposal before uh, corona crisis hit us uh, there was already a discussion that was clear there was no agreement on uh, any tax except uh, plastic tax uh, that would be the only easy one but at the same time uh, it's not uh, very important and it uh, won't really uh, do the trick and as far as others are concerned, I mean, there's lots of ideas, but it's uh, not um, uh, possible uh, to see where uh, and if there would be an agreement on any of these. And there's another question related to... Uh, and, uh, I think also the Commission uh, is very much uh, under the impression that this will take uh, a lot of time and it's not clear that uh, we will arrive there. And another question related to the MFF recovery fund. Um, there's a question related to um, the rebates, um, the gradual um, reduction or, um, or, or exiting the rebate system which you have with respect to, to the MFF. So the question is, uh, what kind of progress do you see with respect to that issue and how important will it be in the context of the MFF negotiations? I mean, since uh, earlier you know, the question was asked, uh, what about the frugals and uh, what can be done uh, to bring the frugals on board? I guess uh, rebate is one of the issues. Uh, they have been uh, saying this uh, time and again, that that is part. And in the end, uh, as I said, you will need a package uh, where everybody is a winner and where everybody can show to his uh, national parliament that they did get something out of it. And uh, in this context, uh, we have to look also at the rebate. And it's very interesting uh, to see that also the Commission has uh, revised its uh, former position on rebate, where they said it's got to be phased out uh, quite rapidly. This is not what they're saying uh, at this stage. They say it needs to be phased out at some stage, but much later. Very good. Let's go back and, and listen to another question. Uh, I have here on my list Tanya Milevska. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, you Tanya, you're being unmuted. Uh, we can hear you, I think, already. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes, so I I'll just go back to enlargement, if I may. Uh, I'm Tanya Milevska from the Macedonian News Agency. Uh, Ambassador, I would like a bit more, um, a, a de a more detailed answer from you, if it's possible, on the upcoming um, negotiating frameworks that will be uh, published in, uh, early next week by the Commission. So, uh, is there first any chance that this could go on um, on the, on the back table uh, before the summit? Uh, is this something that you think will be discussed already at this June General Affairs Council? Um, and and um, do you think that there is a chance uh, to have a clear time frame um, in the conclusions? when when would uh, the first IGC then take place uh, for, for North Macedonia? And, and just um, a, a little sub-question, uh, will the upcoming uh, elections that are supposed to take place in North Macedonia, could this play a role in, in, the, in the conclusion on the member states' part? Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, as you know, the usual way of procedure is uh, first uh, the Commission has to present its proposal. Uh, that is obviously uh, going to happen uh, next week. Uh, then we will take a look at it. Uh, it will go to the working groups and uh, they will uh, try to find out exactly what it means. Uh, there will be first discussions. Then it goes uh, to Corridor and uh, then uh, it goes to Council. But I don't expect that uh, in June uh, there will be a lot of progress at the political level. Um, this is going to be at uh, groups level and uh, m m maybe uh, core repair, but uh, I don't think it's uh, going to go beyond. And that's also why it's very difficult to see days. I mean, first of all, we have to see the position of uh, member states and uh, um, I uh, cannot give you any names, but uh, when, when you ask about uh, elections in uh, North Macedonia, whether they will have an effect or not. Um, well, we have been hearing from uh, some member states uh, that uh, that will uh, kind of also influence uh, their decision on the negotiating uh, framework, which will then be negotiated in, in, in Council first. Thank you. Uh, let's take one more uh, who has raised his hands, Leon de Graaf. Uh, my colleagues will unmute you, Leon de Graaf. Yes, you're not unmuted. Yes, hello, thank you very we much. Can hear you. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for the uh, presentation. I just had a quick question on the June European Council. So, yeah, as you said, the MFF and the recovery plan take the central stage, but are you expecting other topics to be discussed? And I'm specifically uh, referring to the 2050 climate ambition. Thank you. No, I would not. I mean, it's up to Jean-Michel who uh, will um, tell us what the agenda is going to look like. So clearly the focus will be, as you said, on the recovery fund and the MFF. Uh, so this is going to be the first uh, debate of heads, uh, heads of state and uh, government. No negotiations yet, but the first exchange of views. And there might be other issues as well, I can't tell, but uh, I think it's unlikely, uh, I would not expect uh, to see 2050 uh, climate targets to be part of it. And anyways, uh, what you can do in a video conference is uh, very limited. You can only have a very limited uh, set of uh, agenda items, uh, because usually if you have every, everyone uh, taking the floor, that usually is uh, at least uh, three hours. So if you have two items, uh, already uh, close to six hours, and uh, you have a third item, <laughs> it, it, it just doesn't work that way. So by, by 2050, I think this is not uh, an issue right now. Very good. Uh, let's go to some of the written questions now. There have been a number of people who have raised um, the Brexit issue or the future relationship between the EU and the UK. Um, and then I'll take one by Jennifer Rankin from The Guardian who says that on Brexit you said that uh, the UK needs to be more realistic. But what, if the does, what happens if the UK doesn't move? Should both sides prepare already for a no deal? That's her question. Well, at some stage, uh, we will have to look at uh, whether we believe uh, that uh, an agreement is, is, is very likely and uh, that probably not a lot of uh, contingency uh, measures have to be planned. Uh, but, but if uh, it is uh, quite unclear, definitely also on the EU side, we'll start doing this, yes. There's, uh, there are a couple of questions related to uh, migration asylum policy. Uh, in your introduction, you said that this is a difficult file, and we all know that, and that it's, uh, I think you said it's ideological often and toxic. I think these were the words which you mentioned. Um, there are a number of people who are asking questions uh, with respect to migration and, and asking as to whether um, relocation and mandatory relocation will have to be part of the compromise um, or not, or whether there will be a compromise which will include, exclude, sorry, uh, mandatory relocation topic which has been heavily discussed over years now. Uh, what's your take on this one? Thank you. Well, let me give you my uh, also personal assessment on this. So I think there is a agreement that there needs to be mandatory um, solidarity, but uh, the question is can solidarity come in different forms like there's a, some member states uh, who do relocation and others who decide to give money. For me personally, it's difficult to see that, uh, you know, you can just say, 
um, uh, well, uh, will not take any uh, migrants or refugees, uh, never ever, and uh, we'll just, uh, you know, pay a little bit of money or do some other things uh, to help. Uh, basically, that is the situation that we're having now, and uh, you, you can see that uh, there's a lot of refugees, migrants now amassing in, in Malta. You have this in uh, Cyprus and Greece, and uh, there is a uh, little solidarity of this, and this is uh, what needs to be done. So, in the end, I don't believe uh, that you can really have a solution to the migration uh, file uh, if not in the end, at some stage, uh, there's uh, some kind of mandatory relocation. Maybe there can be an interim uh, phase, uh, but, but in the end, I think it's for me very difficult to see that there could be an agreement and a functioning system for migration and asylum without uh, mandatory relocation. Thank you. There are, there's another question, uh, another topic, uh, which relates to uh, minimum income. Uh, we know that there, there will be a commission proposal. We also know that um, the German presidency or parts of the German government um, uh, had said that uh, minimum income will be something which will be pushed um, during the German presidency. How do you see this file also now in light of the new circumstances uh, related to COVID-19? Well, politically, uh, it's an important uh, file, continues to be an important file. At the same time, uh, as far as I remember, the Commission is uh, going to come up uh, with a proposal quite late uh, in the German uh, presidency. That means uh, it is unlikely uh, or impossible that uh, we will close uh, this, uh, but uh, discussions then could start in the German presidency, and uh, that is something uh, we would like to see. Very good, yes, thank you. But it's, also not, uh, it's also not going to be easy uh, to solve this because uh, there's different uh, systems in every country and uh, also uh, minimum wages uh, differ quite a lot. So somehow you will have to find a good uh, compromise uh, that uh, takes on board everybody because this is also unanimity. Let's take one more uh, person who raised um, his hand. It's Adam Isaacs. Um, Adam Isaacs. Uh, you are now unmuted. Um, can you hear us? Can we hear you? Yes, thank you very yes, much. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, we had we opened the foreign policy discussion with a discussion on China, um, but I was wondering um, on the multilateral framework, what uh, thought had been given to the proposal for the D10, this sort of widened group of the G7 for democracies? And the question, which I'm sure you won't answer, is what strategy and what thought is being given to how we preserve the transatlantic relationship in the case of uh, Trump being re-elected in November. That's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, on uh, G G10 uh, or whatever uh, different ideas are floating around, uh, so for, for the time being, I mean, we stick uh, to G7 and uh, I think we've been very clear, so if uh, other countries uh, might be invited, it is not as participants, uh, but as guests. And uh, this can only be unanimously decided by the G7, uh, whether they want to enlarge in this uh, group or not. And uh, you have followed this uh, discussion probably about Russia, and I, I don't see that uh, there's any possibility uh, to, to make Russia come back uh, to G7, as long as the present situation uh, also concerning uh, uh, Ukraine uh, prevails. On uh, transatlantic relations, I think that is something uh, uh, we, we come to <laughs> when uh, elections uh, have been done and we know the results. <laughs> yes, um, there well, is... Um, time. Now it's MFF recovery, Brexit and uh, transatlantic relations, I don't exclude, might be uh, an issue uh, in the third phase of uh, the German uh, presidency. But uh, we'll have to see first what the situation is. <laughs> Going back to phase one, because there's a question here um, which is linking um, the rule of law um, to the MFF and to uh, conditionalities, uh, meaning if there are uh, continuous uh, breaches of uh, rule of law, um, also maybe also indicated in the annual report, uh, which the Commission will present, um, how will or what kind of um, MFF conditionality can be foreseen and is it likely, given that you need a consensus of all member states on an agreement on both the MFF and the recovery fund instruments? Well, for us, this uh, rule of law um, in the MFF is uh, is very important, and uh, we like very much what the Commission has been now proposed uh, for for a second time. 
that uh, if there are problems with the rule of law, then uh, they can uh, stop uh, giving money to the concerned the member states unless uh, there is a, um, a qualified majority uh, in the council against uh, the commission proposal, which means a reversed uh, qualified majority. We think this is a very strong signal and we would very much like to see this uh, part of the MFF. Now, as you just said, I mean, uh, MFF and recovery fund, this is unanimity, so everybody needs to agree to it. And uh, that means uh, that is something uh, that needs to be negotiated. And I would rather believe uh, that is something that is, uh, will only be resolved uh, at the uh, level of heads of state and the government and uh, not uh, by, by uh, you know, uh, bodies which are preparing. Uh, the European Council. So that is something that is going to be for, for the final stages of uh, negotiations, obviously. Yes, de definitely a tricky and difficult one. Um, one question which is being posed, and it again relates to, uh, to the recovery instrument, uh, relates to the uh, role of the Green Deal. So in which way you were referring to the Green Deal, uh, but the question was more related to, uh, that's uh, what I also mentioned at the beginning, the Green Recovery. So how much do you expect that uh, an agreement on, on, on uh, the recovery um, instrument uh, will be including the green dimension? How strong will it uh, find itself in that agreement? Well, uh, definitely, uh, you will see a lot of green deal in the uh, EU recovery plans, uh, as well as an MFF. An MFF, you have like 25% uh, needs to be uh, green deal related or the money spent. And also when it comes to the objectives uh, for recovery, it's about promoting digitization, but also moving uh, in the direction of a green economy. So this plays a, a very important role. And um, uh, coming back uh, to 2050 targets, which was uh, asked uh, earlier. So what I cannot foresee is uh, whether uh, this somehow will also intermingle uh, with this EU uh, uh, recovery when the final negotiations are being done. Uh, that is something that uh, is, uh, I, uh, could, could be possible. But difficult no, I... uh, to, to, to say it's going to happen. It will depend a little bit on the dynamics of uh, negotiations. Just one um, last question, which was posed in a written form because we're running out of time, unfortunately. It relates to the Conference on the Future of Europe. You were referring to that in your introductory remarks, um, also with respect to the process and the difficulties now, obviously the pandemic is causing to bring people together in the context of the conference. Uh, but here someone is asking, um, when do you foresee that the conference can actually be launched? Uh, we, before the crisis started, 9 May was a date to officially launch it. Now the question is, when will it be launched? And the second question related to the conference is uh, about the content. Um, so in light of the COVID-19 crisis, in light of the experiences we're going through, how do we need to adapt uh, in terms of what the conference will actually be, will be dealing with? What are the subjects uh, we need to concentrate on? And how does the COVID-19 crisis change um, that from the perspective of of, of the content of the conference. Yeah, I would not be in a position uh, to give a date yet. Uh, I think what one can say is uh, once uh, the pandemic is uh, overcome and the physical meetings will be possible again, I think then uh, it's very likely that um, the conference on the future of Europe will start. So maybe it's going to be in September, maybe it's going to be in October or later. It's a bit uh, difficult to see at this stage. Uh, that's also why from our side, uh, there's no uh, date uh, foreseen. And uh, we'll get to that uh, later. When it comes to the mandate, obviously uh, this will COVID and uh, the lessons learned um, that will have to be included uh, clearly. I mean, uh, this is going to be uh, a different uh, conference after COVID than before COVID. Many of the issues that had already been in these draft uh, mandates uh, remain relevant, but I think uh, there will be uh, uh, further uh, to, to come. And uh, that is something that uh, we are reflecting right now also on the council side. Uh, I believe the same is uh, true for, for European uh, Parliament that will have to be adapted and uh, to be taken into account. I would say it's, it's about uh, basically about lessons learned and uh, what will have to be changed. And uh, maybe we also talk about new competences for the European Union. Now, we only have two minutes left, so let me pose a final question. 
Um, if we put ourselves um, into uh, late December or early January of next year, um, and we ask ourselves as to whether the German presidency was a success or, knock on wood, a failure, um, what would you consider would be the issue which will be uh, the key element on the basis of which you will be able to answer that question? So what is the key measure, measure the success or, again, knocking on woods that it won't happen, a potential failure of the German presidency? Well, uh, I think the number one issue is uh, that we find an agreement on MFF recovery. That means uh, that we preserve uh, the Eurozone and the European Union and that uh, we all uh, have a possibility uh, to, to come uh, out of the crisis uh, uh, in not uh, too bad a shape. I think this is uh, the overall issue. And the second, uh, I would say, is Brexit. If we get these uh, two things uh, done, I would say this will then be a remarkably uh, successful presidency. Very good. And I think the first uh, uh, depends a lot on us, EU27. On Brexit, we also depend on what happens in London. So uh, we have now run out of time. I want to thank you very much for taking this hour with us. I know how um, how difficult it is uh, as you are approaching the role of being becoming uh, the ambassador, the permanent representative of a country which will be holding the presidency weeks ahead. So thank you very much for sharing your time with us. I want to also thank all the participants. We had uh, a, a big lineup, a lot of people who participate, many questions that were raised. I hope that I um, was able to cover a good number of them. I was not able to cover all of them, definitely not because there were too many. Thank you for that. We will also find a way to transmit uh, your, your questions and some were even rather comments um, to the German um, to the German permanent representation so that they're aware at least of what you had in mind. So thank you again, Mr. Ambassador. We wish you all the good luck uh, for the German presidency. We will be following it closely, obviously. And thank you to all the participants for being with us uh, this morning. And I wish you a good remaining day. So thank you. Thank you very much and have a good day, everybody. Thank you.